It's time for Branding Business, the only show that brings branding experts and corporate executives together to explore how branding your business can improve both your top-line growth and bottom-line performance. Brought to you by Rikus Baird. And now, here's your host. Welcome to Branding Business with Rikus Baird. I'm Ryan Rikus, and today's show topic is focused on connecting a brand promise with primary audiences. We're very lucky to have one of the leading authorities on the topic, Dr. Joseph Michelli of the Michelli Experience. Joseph is an internationally sought-after speaker, best-selling author, organizational consultant who helps companies transform their workplaces through a focus on a total customer experience. You might have heard his name before. He um, has a number of books out. His latest is Leading the Starbucks Way. Five Principles for Connecting with Your Customers, Your Products, and Your People. His other best-selling books include The Zappos Experience, Five Principles to Inspire, Engage, and Wow, Prescription for Excellence, Leadership Book with UCLA Health System, was actually a number one New York Times bestseller, The New Gold Standard in collaboration with the Ritz-Carlton, and I think it's important to say this is Joseph's second book covering Starbucks, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that in a moment, but... uh, Let's get on with it. Joseph, welcome to Brand New Business. Well, you missed my most important credential. I've worked with you, and I've had the good fortune <laughs> of seeing what you guys do in brand space. So uh, that, that's what you should have hit on right there. Well, we could talk about that. <laughs> well, yes, we did enjoy that experience, and uh, I think we share a lot of the same uh, philosophies and, ex- and experiences of how a brand is brought to life through its employees and then ultimately, of course, achieved success through the, uh, the experience with the customers. So, yes, we definitely enjoy working together, and, um, well, let's get into this new book. I know it's, what, launched uh, the last couple days, so um, let me ask the question, why did you choose to cover Starbucks again? Wow, first off, they helped me get my kids through college the first time around, so I couldn't (laughs) miss the chance to do that again. Actually, the truth of the matter is this brand's really different than when I last visited them. I was looking back at notes that I was taking back in 2004, working with the senior leadership team at Starbucks, and they've been through so much. I mean, there's a period of time they were opening six new stores a day, you know, a store every four hours somewhere on the planet. So they were in this meteoric growth cycle, and then there was the global recession, and the brand laid off people and retooled some of its product and had to really rethink their turnaround strategy. So coming back and visiting the brand now at a different point in its maturation was a pretty exciting opportunity to teach people, I think, something other than what it takes to get catch fire as a brand. It's really about how do you sustain yourself over the long haul. So you're right. In 2004, Schultz had left, and uh, when he came back in 2008, so a lot had changed there. Yeah, you'd gone to Chief Global Strategist for a while. Um, they brought in Jim Allen from Allen, the Walmart family, for a period of time. Uh, yeah, things changed, and it, it uh, took Howard's return back to the brand to get the intimacy again and to refocus on the brand experience that they had commoditized a bit by focusing on ROI and and really trying to scale the brand for efficiency. So, yeah, it was a it was a return and not an easy one to do. I mean, most of the entrepreneurial CEOs don't really do it very well when they have to come back and and turn the ship. But Howard did it extraordinarily well. Well, I know you and I have talked quite a bit about the topic of culture and how important that is. And I know uh, that was a key component of changing this brand, evolving the brand. And I remember reading that uh, it was uh, Schultz who said, this isn't a change in our business strategy, but really more of a a love and nurturing. And and he demonstrated that even back in 2008 by taking 10,000 of his top people to New Orleans to uh, work together and and help uh, rebuild New Orleans after Katrina. So, I mean, it's just another example of, of culture and, and leadership at the same time. Absolutely. You know, a lot of there are a lot of hard choices on behalf of culture. There's a lot of hard choices to really keep your brand connected to its core values, to keep your brand connected to its community, to keep your brand connected to its front line, to its leadership. And yeah, culture is a lot of the language we use. It's such a soft-sounding word, but you can break this down to very tangible behaviors, some of which include the willingness to expend some money to bring people together in community to not only learn and interact with each other to create that bond, but also to have them do something extraordinary, which in that point was to go post Katrina and actually help the citizens of New Orleans. And despite the expenditures that were involved, it was a pivot point for the brand to move forward in a very aggressive 
uh, transformational agenda. Well, in a, in a similar manner, but not only not only culture, but also a means of really getting back to the core. Uh, of course, um, it was well publicized, and, and I'm sure you covered it in your book. The um, the reality that Schultz decided to close every one of the 7,100 stores for an afternoon of retraining, and and it cost the company millions. I think six or eight million dollars to close it that afternoon. And I know it took a lot of heat initially, but uh, maybe you could speak a little bit about that as well. Certainly. Well, and this goes to the really first principle that is in the new book. It's called you know, Saber and Elevate, which is a lot about returning to passion for your products. You know, there are those out there, uh, Ryan, who would tell you straight up that you don't really have to care about what you sell. All you need to do is know how to sell it. And that may be true for a short period of time. I mean, you may be able to sell anything to anybody for a short period of time just based on your sales techniques alone. But in point of fact, in the world in which we live today, consumers increasingly want people who have an authentic passion for their products. And so things like shutting down the stores came down to the fact that they weren't pulling great espresso shots. And they'd gotten so busy hiring just bodies to fill the growth machine that they hadn't selected well for people who had an interest in coffee. They hadn't trained as well as they did in the early days. And so the shutdown really was a closing in the afternoon. You'd walk up to a Starbucks store, and there'd be a sign that says, we're closed to retrain people and pulling a perfect shot. And customers, you know, definitely the, the cash register didn't ring that afternoon. It was a great publicity message because it got all kinds of attention. We're still talking about it today. It wasn't done as a publicity ploy. It was done because it was the right thing to do. Uh, and it also kind of redoubled the message to the consumer that we're willing to eschew profits for an afternoon in order to try to retool ourselves around the passion for product. Well, you're absolutely right. It was a bold move. It was strong leadership, and it really getting back to the core of their business. And it wasn't about shifting a major strategic shift at all. It was really getting back to the core and, and what uh, not only the product, but also the experience, the quality of the experience as well. So you're absolutely right. We're still talking about it today, what, four years later. So powerful message internally and externally. And, and as you know, and we work together, we build the brand from within. That's our philosophy, is that you don't... Yeah, you do build... it. I mean, I can I just say this? Because I, I, I'm here three days after the launch of the book. I really chose to be here with you because, honestly, and, and I'm not blowing smoke, you're one of the, the, you are one of the people, and I think your firm in particular, understands that branding is not some exercise that's done based on some polling data alone. It really is the synthesis of the core of a brand being articulated by great people who can help find what that is and being able to help lead an organization in the direction of the brand. I mean, we have some wonderful marketing exercises that get done around the globe that fall apart because there wasn't the work done to build the brand from the inside out. So um, I'm here with intent and purpose and you know, I, I certainly appreciate having the opportunity to talk about the book, but I'm mostly here to be excited about about helping people understand that very premise. Well, I appreciate the feedback and, and compliment, Joseph. And the reality is, you're absolutely right. Build the brand from within. Build it upon the strengths. Uh, if you just do research, uh, people only know what they know. They don't know where you're going. They don't know where the organization has potential. And sometimes you have to figure that out. And overlay that, of course, with what you're really great at so that you can move the perceptions forward because you can't have a brand uh, living upon old perceptions. It's just not going to take them forward at all. And uh, I as well greatly appreciate your time today. Uh, I know the book's just launched, what, three days ago? I haven't even had a chance to, uh, to break into it yet. I have your outline. I'm going to ask you a few more questions about it, though. So um, I, I just find it fascinating. I've read every one of your books and, and apply them to our, our world. As you know, um, we are primarily focused on B2B, so some of your examples are B2B, some are, are B2C. I'd like for you to address our audience with that in mind. So, well, you know, I, Starbucks I is a B2B business, too. I mean, I think we always think of the B2C side of the business, but let me give you a sense of what Starbucks does on the B2B side. So they have a food service side. So Starbucks on that side of the business is offering training and marketing and merchandising expert, expertise along with the actual equipment and a whole portfolio of beverage products, whether that's brewed coffee or hot and cold espresso beverages. And they're doing that in the food service sector. So they are sourcing the restaurants of the world that are serving Starbucks. So they are in the B2B space. If you go to a conference anywhere, you're likely to go to a break station, and there's likely to be a sign that says, we proudly brew Starbucks coffee. That's an example of it. They're in the licensed store space. 
They're helping stores like Kroger's and Bonds and Safeway, the large supermarket chain, own and staff and operate those physical stores and the kiosks under the Starbucks-approved license. Um, in addition to that, they have licensing agreements where they're working with actual product vendors. So they're in a uh, North American coffee partnership agreement with PepsiCo of North America, and they're providing the ready-to-drink products like Frappuccino blended uh, beverages that you're likely to get or Starbucks double shot espresso drinks. They're in joint venture agreements in the B2B space. So Starbucks leadership is working with people in other countries to be successful in some of the joint ventures, particularly in places like India, where they, along with Tata India, are joint venturing to be successful in delivery of coffee products in that country. And because of that, we spend time in the book looking at how similar are the principles used in developing a B to C connection and a B2B connection with customers. And there's a great deal of similarity and there's some really striking differences. And those in your audience who are in the, the B2B space know that a lot of the differences have to be how, how slow decision making happens up front, how long the, rel- the relationship incubation cycle is. It also though, on the backside, the benefits are often the stickiness of the relationships in the B2B, the data driven nature of it. So if you can prove your value, you tend to stay around, whereas in the B2C, it can be such a capricious, one day they love you, the next day they, they're not with you kind of relationship. So we talk about both the similarities and the nuances, but this is not purely a B2C play. I think that was a perfect summary. Thanks for clarifying that. I think often people only associate to that consumer component of a brand, but often, as you outlined, there are many different distribution strategies that uh, exist and those need to be nurtured, and those are often based upon um, relationships, as, as you just outlined. And um, you know, the consumer pull through is important, but the B two B component of it is is critical as well. And be able to understand that there are uh, longer sales cycles. There, um, it, it's not a commodity purchase, if you will. There are many choices and many options, and um, and the the brand promise, whether it's B two B, B two C, needs to overlap, but. Each are therefore individually important and might have different nuances to them, but under one overarching brand promise. And, Amen. Uh, and you know, the end play is that in the B to B space, most of the time, the consumer, the consumer of those goods, that other business, is looking to be successful. They're looking for you to make them smarter and more effective in the marketplace. They care about your thought leadership. They care about some things that maybe they don't care about in the consumer space. But in the end of the day, it's still about relationships and helping the customer, whatever that looks like, be more successful over the long term. Mm-hmm. Well, let me shift you a little bit of gears here. I always ask our clients, the CEO uh, and executive leadership team, you have three audiences, your employees, your customers, and shareholders. Who do you place first in the priority list? And uh, it's interesting. I get a variety of answers to that. And, of course, I have my own opinion. I'm, uh, you and I, I'm sure, probably share the same opinion here. But um, maybe you want to speak a, a little bit about that. It's a total bogus question. I'm telling you, I push back really hard on it because every time I get into this discussion with people, it, it, it really, it's totally irrelevant. Which of your children do you love more? You know, <laughs> I mean, it comes down to that in the end of the day. If you're not loving every single one of these players, you're not going to be in business. Now, the reality is, that your children are going to tell you how you love the other one more than you love them, and they're going to be competing resources at times, and there's going to be a constant tension to demonstrate that there is an equity of love. Without one, the other doesn't prosper. I think Starbucks would say that they make the bulk of their decisions from the standpoint, the lens of their employee, um, but the lens of the customer is critical, and so is the shareholder. I think ultimately the shareholder should be caring most about the profitability of the brand and less about the tactical decision making. I mean, if you fail to deliver the profits for the shareholder, then they have every right to question everything about you and pull you out of your functioning role. But if you deliver the results to the shareholder through profitability, then the decisions about how you treat the customer and how you treat the employee should be yours as a leader. And I think that's the key here. Um, you got to be profitable, but you have to treat people in a high efficiency organization through the lens of humanity. I agree with you, and uh, you're absolutely right. The result is happy shareholders. How you get there is through anticipating what your customers want 
and how it's delivered is through the employee. And I think in my mind, you have to kind of think about it in that manner. And it sounds like we're on the same page. So, well, you know, let me ask I you a question. You and I would agree. I mean, you know, Drucker said it best. We're in business to create a customer. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And you have to treat employees well if you really want those customers to show up and stick around. Yeah. And the, and the customers know how to deliver your brand promise and how they're all aligned. And, and so that gets me to the next question is, you know, every organization goes through change, and that's often when we're brought in to help um, crystallize um, that change and, and develop a new brand promise for the company of where it's going. Your work is involving change constantly, and so can you give some best practices on, on how you help an organization go through change and how you uh, how the employees um, accept change and then how they really are able to deliver it? Well, you know, it starts with a fundamental belief that people want to be seen and they want to be heard. So if you take the time up front to try to access what people think and feel about the important issues that you're trying to change, you're way ahead of the power curve. I see so many organizations trying to push change down through the ranks, having never spent the, the time to, to really assess what's going on. You know, Paul Tillich, the philosopher, said the first act of love is to listen. So a lot of the successful change mo movements really spend more time listening than they do talking. Once you've listened well and you've pulled in disparate threads and you use quality analysis to understand where the trends are, where the market opportunities are, then you position your change structure and you position your messaging, you keep a constant and consistent hand on the messaging, you find your change agents, those who are formally tapped and those who de facto move change in your organization, you help them become advocates for the new change message by spending quality time with them understanding the value proposition. And over time, as much as we talk about how terrible and how hard it is to do corporate change, I've watched massive organizations change very effectively. Starbucks right now, in the third quarter of 2013, had record-breaking profits. This is a brand that's been around since 1974. They've initiated a bold set of agenda items to change who they were in 2004. All the woe and gloom and doom of change just isn't, I mean, I see great organizations effectively changing in widespread ways. You're absolutely right. It's, it's all about how you go about it. Let's get back to your book a moment. You uh, and you just mentioned uh, in reference back to Starbucks. You spoke earlier about the savor and elevate. Now um, your next section is love to be loved, and I think that references back to just a conversation a moment ago. Maybe you can kind of enlighten our audience about that. Well, I put a I have a brand curve, a beloved brand curve that's in here. Some researchers who spend a lot of time on what it means to be a beloved brand, and you know, not to just be liked, but to have a consumer really emotionally engaged in you. And even if you're in the B2B space, a beloved brand, the ultimate test I often use is if you were to tell a business colleague of yours to go and use a particular, you know, a, a particular product, and if your business product colleague came back to you afterwards and said, you know, I really didn't like it, your reaction, if it's a beloved brand, would be to look at your colleague and say, what's wrong with my colleague? Right? I mean, you would assume that your colleague has a de defect before you would actually believe that the brand you sent them to has a defect. Your experience is so, so connected, even through your identity, to what this brand is delivering, that you would not think twice about the brand as having a, a, a breakdown. And I think that that chapter is all about what it takes to take your customer above that level of respecting you, which is a lot better than just thinking you're competent, taking you up to that notion where they're proud they made the choice to pick you, and even up to that higher level of true passion. I really genuinely care that you are successful. You source me so well that I can't imagine a world without you. Joseph, we have roughly about five minutes left, but I'd love to hear the balance, the key sections of your book. Can I take us through those other areas? I think you have Reach for yeah, Common Ground, Yeah, I think the key one, let me just give you the last one that I really am super excited about in this book. I think brands have become so vanilla in the world today. They try to stand for everything and nothing all at the same time. They don't want to raise controversy. They don't want to get behind anything. They just want everybody to like them. They're very likable. But do they really stand for anything? So Starbucks, in my opinion, and the last principle that I talk about in this book really kind of gets at it. And it's about kind of challenging and creating this legacy of yours. And, and the actual language is called the cherish and challenge your legacy for the principle. But bottom line is Howard Schultz, for example, took a 
uh, ad out in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, around the last election cycle. He basically said, look, I want to challenge my business colleagues and I want to challenge my customers to not support political candidates who failed to do anything but pander for their own reelection and are doing very little to spur the economy from the jobs. Starbucks has committed itself to employment for youth. That is a big part of their future vision. It's not all, you know, pie in the sky stuff. If you don't have jobs for young people, you don't have people buying Starbucks. So if there is a mutual benefit to taking the stand. So he puts the ad out. He gets some pushback from your shareholders to kind of support the wisdom of you asking that question earlier, even though I kind of pushed it back. I mean, the shareholders didn't like it. You know, why are you investing any money, personal or otherwise, in messaging to the world that we should take a stand in the political arena? And ultimately, Howard goes beyond that. He encourages his customers to donate money. He gives armbands for $5 contributions. The money is used for a seed pool for, for financing small business enterprises that are going to create jobs. Fast forward to a little company up in Maine called Gelato Fiasco. This little brand has a successful gelateria in Maine and wants to expand out and open a new one and have seven new jobs created. They can't find the money for the place. They go to this fund that Starbucks has encouraged, and lo and behold, they're able to open the new place, hire the new people, be successful, even serve coffee just a couple of blocks away from an existing Starbucks store. They become so successful that they actually are now distributing gelato into the supermarket name, and a portion of the proceeds of one of those products is now feeding back into that pool. So here's the upshot. Some people are going to really hate you for getting to be politically active, but a lot of people, even if they don't agree with your activism, are going to feel like, well, you know, they take a stand. They have a heart. They have a soul, and people care to be connected with soulful brands. So my, my lesson in here is know what you stand for. Take a stand. Don't, you know, don't be stupid with your stand. But clearly understand that people want real. They want authentic and they want palpable. And that's true in the business-to-business space as much as it's in the business-to-customers. Well, I couldn't agree more with you. You have to take a stand. You have to stand out. You have to be known for something. Otherwise, you just fall for everything. And uh, every... Every beloved brand is known for one thing, and that doesn't mean you have to be liked by everybody, only those that matter, and those are your key customers, your core audience, and that's really where the focus should be. Amen, and I think there's so much business for those people who really understand their markets, right? And to try to to seek markets that are not your own means you lose your own and you also don't attract the others. Couldn't agree more, Joseph. We're nearing our time limit here. Any final thoughts or insights to share with our listeners? No, I just look forward to uh, our ongoing relationship, Ryan. You've been great to work with, and I've seen the the success you've brought on Sprant. Thanks for allowing me to continue to be a part of a relationship with you. And uh, I'm excited to have this new book out. We're looking ahead to 2015, too. We're releasing, you know, just released this book three days ago. But in 2015, we're going to be coming out with another book about Mercedes. We're working with uh, Steve Cannon, the CEO over at Mercedes USA, uh, on their brand and It's just been an exciting, exciting run for me with some amazing companies and amazing people like you. So thanks for for giving me the time. Well, thank you, Joseph, and um, really appreciate your insights today. I was going to ask about your new book, but then again, knowing you, I I figured you already had it in the works, so uh, I'll look forward to that one as well. Hey, if our listeners have any questions of you, how could they best reach you? Is it a website or email? Well, I think they can get a hold of you. That's always a good thing, so you oh, can uh, okay. connect with me. But in addition to that, they can get a hold of me straight through. Uh, they can go through my website at josephmichelli.com. We've got all of our contact information there. And that's Joseph, the common spelling, J-O-S-E-P-H. And then the last name is spelled M-I-C-H-E-L-L-I. Well, perfect. Thank you, Joseph. Really appreciate your time. And once again, best of luck on your new book. Thank you, Ryan. Well, that concludes our show for today. This is Ryan Rikus, and you've been listening to another edition of Brandy Business with Rikus Baird. If you'd like to listen to past shows or read our blog series, visit brandybusiness.com. Until our next show, stay focused on your brand promise. You've been listening to Branding Business, the only show that brings branding experts and corporate executives together to explore how branding your business can improve both your top-line growth and bottom-line performance. To hear more, simply visit our website, brandingbusiness.com, or tune in next week to learn how you, too, can build your brand and move your business forward. Brought to you by Rikus Baird.